Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another week of GR. So let me start with a few announcements, actually two announcements. The first is that there will be a teaching evaluation and I was just informed that the teaching evaluation started for the ETH students. I think we already had one for university students. I haven't received any results yet, but there's now the evaluation for the ETH students. So I would like to ask you to fill in the corresponding forms, answer the questions. This will be very useful for me, in particular, of course, for future courses. So I really would like to encourage you to use this opportunity to give some feedback. The deadline is on the 11th of December. So that happens to be my birthday. So I hope you will be gentle with the evaluation. Um, um, anyway, I mean, you should give your honest feedback. and. Um, Nevertheless, if you have feedback that you think would immediately improve the course, you may, of course, always send email. Some of you did that, and I'm always happy to take into account um, your opinions and um, your advice. The other announcement concerns um, your possible future as a student at ETH. You may all have to write a master thesis. Some of you may even want to do a semester project before. And there are usually questions, actually, I received many of them of people who are asking whether we are offering projects in my research group. And because we have many requests, we are usually organizing an information event where we present possible projects within the group. And um, these are projects usually connected to quantum information theory, but there is also part of that, or at least some overlap with general relativity. The overlap will mostly be about um, the questions of quantum gravity. You're not really working um, on trying to develop a theory of quantum gravity yet, that's too far away, but trying to understand on even more basic systems how quantum information and quantum mechanics um, kind of links to questions in gravity theory. This information event will take place this week on Thursday at five o'clock. A Zoom link will be posted on the group webpage. The group webpage is on qit.ethz.ch. You're all welcome to join. And um, it's also possible as external students to write projects. So this is also an event that is open to the university students. Okay. Uh, there is uh, a one question that will it oh, yes. be recorded? Uh -huh. uh, yes, I will probably record, yes, let me record the main part of that, where we present the projects. There will also be a question session, and there I will ask the students whether they are okay with recording. Okay, last time at the very end of the lecture, some of you asked me to present something that I um, essentially only mentioned in passing namely that the notions of an exterior derivative that we introduce generalizes notions that you have learned in electrodynamics of gradient, divergence, and so on. I think I even made a table, but I didn't prove any of these relations. And, and um, given all the feedback I received also from emails, there's a clear wish that I show that at least for one instance. So I will, instead of immediately starting with the new topic, which is the treatment of matter, so to speak, on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation, I will spend the first quarter of an hour, roughly, to explain you one of these relations in more detail. This will also serve as a preparation for certain things we will anyway do today. So I would therefore spend a bit more time than I would usually for answering um, just, let's say, one question. So um, the example that I chose among those in the table is one that I um, find maybe the most interesting one. I mean, we had gradient, we had rotation, we had divergence. And I think rotation is really an interesting concept to consider from the viewpoint of this exterior derivative. So what do, I, what do we want to do? So what I told you last time is that in electrodynamics in three space, so maybe I should really write here, we are now in three space for the moment, not in four dimensional space time. 
in in electrodynamics in three in three space you express the electromag or the magnetic field by a vector field b which are three vectors there's a vector at any point in space of course this vector also evolves over time but for the moment we exclude the notion of time and in electrodynamics or more generally in mathematics of course there's a there is a, an operation defined which is called the rotation of b which is also of course sometimes denoted by something like this and the understanding there is that this is a new vector field which is obtained by certain derivation rules you take the for example the derivative of the second component with respect to the third um, spatial dimension and minus the opposite and so on now what i told you last time at the end of the last lecture is that it would be more natural in the context of differential geometry. This is now not GR, just differential geometry of three space to say that instead of talking about the vector field, we think of a covector field. So a covector field is an object that takes a vector field as an input, and therefore it's in particular also a so-called one form, which is of course the type of object we, are, we were studying. So that's a one form. This should just be essentially a three vector. So I really write here three vector to stress the understanding that this is now on this side, not a vector in the differential geometric sense necessarily. It's just a thing with three components, which implies that the rules we have here on this side are really rules which may not immediately generalize or not immediately be the same if you go to different coordinates. In electrodynamics, we usually work with with a Cartesian coordinate system. And the way you calculate rotation, of course, involves the coordinates. You are explicitly taking derivatives with respect to the spatial directions, x1, x2, and x3. And if you change to another coordinate system, you would have to ask yourself, how would you have to change the notion of rotation? What I'm telling you now is essentially an answer to that question. It would, um, what we are doing is, immediately giving you a general rule it tells you what the rotation means in general if you are in an arbitrary coordinate system but let's what we actually want to do first is to verify that the claim i made last time is true namely that the exterior derivative now applied to this one form corresponds to the rotation of b so what do i mean by the correspondence there is a natural way to represent a vector or to turn a vector into a one form. And this natural way is, as you may have guessed, or as I told you last time, the lowering operation. So it's called like that because if you think of indices and the object here is a vector with indices upstairs, a one form is a covector, it has indices downstairs. Now, this operation is one that we discussed at length. And now the claim is that this is a so-called commutative diagram. So we can either go in this direction, first represent the B vector as a one form, and then take here the exterior derivative. Or we could take the rotation and then translate this rotation back to a form. So what form is that? That's a of course, a two form because the exterior derivative of a k form gives k plus one form. And how should this translation here work? Here I also gave you a rule, namely um, to have this iota operation, which um, we introduced also last time in the context of the divergent. So this is actually iota with respect to a volume form. Remember, we had to introduce a volume form. I will give you the expression in a minute again for those who don't remember. So the thing that I want to now demonstrate, I mean, this is essentially a more, um, let's say, ex or a slightly extended um, statement or version of the statement I made last time, where I said the rotation corresponds to the exterior derivative. What I want to show now is that this is indeed a commutative diagram in the sense that if we take these two directions, we get the same as if we took these two directions. Now, one thing you have to be aware of, which I already hinted at, is 
that this thing, this rule here is, is a rule we only know for Cartesian coordinates. So in other words, we, we now do this proof in Cartesian coordinates. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, we would have to already know what the generalization of the rotation is. But once we have done that, you could immediately say, now you understand things in Cartesian coordinates. And here, this arrow here is, of course, something that is completely independent of coordinates. That's just the lowering operation. That's an operation that is defined coordinate independently, the exterior derivative as well, and this arrow as well. And this is, of course, something that is invertible. So you may as well go in this direction in a unique way. So instead of taking the rotation, the, the usual rule of taking these derivatives with respect to coordinates, you could now go here, here, and then back here. And these are all arrows that are coordinate independent, and therefore you get automatically a coordinate independent way of cal calculating the rotation. So this would give you an expression for the rotation, which is completely general and not depending on your choice of a Cartesian coordinate system. I will not do that, that's something you could um, work out yourself. I will just show that in Cartesian coordinates, we retrieve here the usual expression for, um, for the rotation. Okay, so if we fix this basis, so we, have, we go into a Cartesian coordinate system, then of course in this basis we can write B as Bi, the components of B, and then the basis vectors, d to the dxi. Now I will from now on just drop the vector arrow. I just put it here in this diagram to make clear it's really um, this object that you know from electrodynamics, but let's drop it. The understanding is that b is still a vector. It's namely a vector written in this way as we do it in differential geometry. And in differential geometry, we don't put the vector arrows. Now, we, if we go to the right in this diagram, if we do this thing here, then um, we can also write this in terms of coordinates. So we get a form omega, and this form omega has components downstairs. What are these components? So they are, um, let me first write the um, expression. So it's the lowering operation applied to B, and then it's the ice component of that. Now the lowering operation is the operation defined by essentially multiplying with the metric tensor. And um, that's, um, if we now assume that we have normal coordinates, so we now insert that, knowledge, with normal coordinates, then we also know that the metric tensor is just the delta function. So I could write this just as bi. By the way, when you see such a, an equation, so here you have omega downstairs i, and here you have b upstairs i, you should immediately complain and say something must be wrong. Here it's not wrong, but what happens is that this is now a coordinate dependent statement. So if you have an index down somewhere and the index up, it could still be that it's a correct statement, but only with respect to a certain choice of coordinates. But here you of course made the choice of coordinates, namely we said, we are doing the calculation in normal coordinates. So that's why this is okay for the moment. Now recall the following. We now need to do the arrow down here, that one. And so for that, it may be useful if I tell you again what the formula was. So if we want to calculate an exterior derivative, what we can do is we first have a prefactor one over one factor one over um, the rank or the of the form factorial, but the rank is one. So this is just a, a complicated way to write one. And then we have the coefficients of the form and then the derivative with respect to something else, let's say j. So the comma just means the partial derivative and then this um, these basis vectors. So that's an expression that we derived last time um, as a coordinate, um, as the coordinate ex expression of the exterior derivative. You can just look it up. Now remember what this basis thing is, this, this um, wedge product or exterior product. 
In this particular case, this just means that we have essentially dxj and dxi minus dxi tensor dxj. That's useful to remember in this case. You will just see why in the next line. So we can now just write down the components of this two form d omega and the components of this two form d omega um, are, can now be retrieved from that expression. And let me just do that, just to make the whole calculation a bit less cumbersome for one of the terms, namely the two three terms. Note that we have in total three terms. We are in three space, so we have three combinations, d omega one, two, d omega one, three, and d omega two, three. But of course, you can always permute the coordinates. So if you show this just for one choice of the coordinates, then it's true for any. So that's, by the way, uh, um, something that it's, it's generally useful to know. If you have any tensor equation, and if you show that an equation is true just for one component, and in addition, you know that the whole statement is true for any choice of basis or for any choice of coordinates, then you have immediately shown it in general. Here, we only show it for Cartesian or normal coordinates, but in normal coordinates, we can still relabel the two and three and make out of it the one and two and so on. So this consideration still applies. So we are not restricting ourselves if we are only showing the whole thing for one of the components. So maybe I should just um, briefly here put some colors into this diagram so, so that you know where we are, um, what we are actually doing. So in some way, the idea is that in this commutative diagram, we start here with this violet um, part, that's the vector field B, and we want to arrive at the orange part and we take the two possible paths. Now we are about to take this path here. So we already did the lowering and now we did do the exterior derivative. So what we have here is already that orange thing. So I just indicate this again with an orange color so that you know we are now there in the diagram the, on the bottom right corner. Now what is d omega 2, 3? Remember that if you want to know the coefficients of a tensor with respect to a basis, what you have to do is just to insert the basis vectors. So the basis vectors that I have to insert here are d to the dx2 and d to the dx3. Now, if I insert these basis elements, it's very easy to see what happens. So if you look at this expression here, I have, of course, a summation over i and j. And these here are the dual vectors. So this term will only become relevant if j is 2 and i is 3. So if j is 2 and i is 3, I get a term here, omega 3, 2. And then I have another term, this one. This one becomes relevant, of course, if i is 2 and j is 3. So I get the opposite here, omega 2, comma 3. You see, this already looks quite good. If you remember what a rotation is, a rotation is some component, for example, the third, and then taking the derivative towards the 2. And of course, indeed, we said before that the omega i corresponds to d i. So this really looks very good because I could now write this as d to the dx2 of b3 minus d to the dx3 of b2, which is of course the expression you know very well from, um, I mean, as the expression for the rotation. Now let's, however, still, I mean, we are not yet done because somehow, I mean, we have now these expressions for, for the, I mean, we, some, we are somehow here and we said this is equivalent to that. So we still have to show that as I go from here to here, indeed, I don't kind of screw up the coefficients. So in some way, so far, we just know that this looks a bit like this, but let's now indeed go into this direction. here. So what does it mean to go in this direction? It means that we apply the Yotta operation and let me also briefly recall or remind you what this is. So recall that the Yotta operation applied to any vector field set 
So yotta is always defined with respect to a volume form. And I said here, the volume form that is relevant is the volume form induced by the metric. So what's that? What's the volume form induced by the metric? This is just um, in coordinates, the square root of um, the determinant of the metric tensor times the basis elements. And we are in three space. So that's a volume form in three space. So that's it. That's what omega g is in, written in terms of a basis. Now, the yotta means the following. If we take the new tensor that is, is created, which is a two form, and applying on some coordinates, let's say we applied on d to the dx, um, yeah, let me see whether how I should label these things. Let me again label them by, let's say, i here and b to the dxj. Then this is by definition the same as just the volume form applied to the vector field set and exactly these vectors that I inserted here um, into the argument of, the, um, of this form here. So that was just to remind you of the definition. There's nothing to understand. I mean, of course, there's a lot to understand here, but there's nothing new here. This is just an expression we had last time for arbitrary vectors here. But in particular, I can, of course, insert the basis vectors at this point. So this is useful because when I insert the basis vectors, what is that? That's just the corresponding component. So I could say that um, this whole thing here is just um, the form omega. So it's the form yotta applied to omega g and the i j's um, component of that. So I now have a, therefore a nice expression for this thing. So let me write it down again. I set of omega i j and let's again do the same um, let's say abbreviation as before, let's just evaluate it for concrete indices. Again, two and three, of course, we choose the same because we want to compare the whole thing. Now, what's that? Um, yeah, maybe just let me add one more step here, just to make clear that um, you can follow or make sure you can follow this expression here, as you remember, can be written as a summation over permutations and then the sign of the permutation times dx, the permutation of one, and now tensor product dx, the permutation of two, so wherever the index two ends up when I apply the permutation and the three. So that's just to remind you what this exterior product does. And now I can just essentially copy this thing because um, I mean the same expression of course applies here the form appears here so I just have to evaluate this thing this whole thing here and by inserting these vectors so what happens if I insert these vectors so first note what I mean, this, the last two arguments that I'm inserting is d to the dx um, i. Okay, let, let me just write this again. Okay, so it's omega g set d to the dx 2 and d to the dx 3. So if I apply 2 to the dx 3, so 2 to the dx 2 will be acted on by this element here. So this will act on d to the dx2. This will only give a contribution if pi2 is equal to 2. The same here. This third argument will be acted on by this part of the tensor product. So I will only get a contribution if pi3 is actually equal to 3. But if I have a permutation such that pi2 gives 2 and pi3 gives 3, then the only 
possibility that is left is that, that this permutation is the identity. So in particular, pi one will be one. So this part here of the, of the tensor will act on set. But what does this do if it acts on set? It, it will just extract the pi one, the pi first component of set. And the pi one is one. So it will extract the component set one. Okay, actually there should be an equality. So that's what this does. It gives set one. Notice that I have here already set this equal to one because we are in normal coordinates, the determinant of the metric in space, we are now not in space time, is just one. So in other words, we have somehow identified that um, a general expression for what it means in three space to apply this iota function to a vector field. Now the vector field we are interested in is rotation of B, because look here in this diagram, Yota is applied to rot B. So set, I now set um, set equal to rot B because that corresponds to going here and here. So we are now going in this direction. So what does that mean? I essentially calculate, I want to calculate Yota applied to rot B omega G, should always be an omega G and then the two, three component. That's again the orange thing. So this is the orange thing I get by taking this path. First applying rot, and then to the rot I apply the iota. But what is that? Now I can just use this calculation. What it means is just the first component of, of whatever I put in here. So it's rot B and the first component. And now, of course, we apply the usual expression of rot because we want to see whether this is compatible in this diagram. But what is the first component of rot B? That's, of course, exactly the derivative to the second component of B3. So I should maybe, for consistency, put this index up minus uh, B3, set three, but rot one, D to the DX3 of B2. Now we can compare the two orange things. So we, we obtain this orange thing via one, one path and got this. We then obtain this orange thing by the other path. And obviously the two, the two agree. So what we have shown therefore is that this, this diagram commutes or written maybe in terms of um, just an, an, an expression. We had first applied the lowering operation to B and then apply the derivative to the whole thing. That was the first path we took. And we have shown that this is the same as first applying the rotation and then the iota operation on the rotation of B. And this whole thing with the um, volume form and these two things gave exactly the same expressions in terms of coordinates when you do it in terms of um, normal coordinates. Okay, that concludes this little calculation. To summarize, we have shown indeed that the rotation of a vector field is in this more general context of talking about, in the, about exterior products, actually just an exterior product, uh, sorry, exterior derivative. So in, in the context of, of um, differential forms, the rotation corresponds to an exterior derivative. The trick here is of course, we first have to map the vectors to the right objects. And this is generally true. I told you last time that, that what we usually understand as a gradient in electrodynamics and represent as a vector is actually a covector. So there we also do this translation. And similar things are true when we, for example, talk about an electric field. So an electric field could have a much more natural representation as a two form. And in the same way as this two form here is related to the field rot B. Okay, any questions to this addition to the last hour? Okay, I don't hear anything. <laughs>
So let me therefore now continue with the new chapter. And of course, there will also be the break. So if you first need to digest, what I said. Uh, there is one question, chat. Yes, okay. Why don't we work with a form then? Um, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Why don't you in electrodynamics work with, with, with K forms? Didn't I do that when I taught electrodynamics? I actually thought I, I would do it usually. But, um, you know, the problem is that we usually start with three dimensional space. And that's the intuition. I mean, that's how electrodynamics was built. And in some way, you could say that electrodynamics was actually the reason for that we discovered special relativity. So if you take a historical approach, and it's questionable whether a historical approach is actually a good pedagogical approach. Nevertheless, if you take a historical approach, it's, it's um, natural to talk first about three space and not about four dimensional space. And now in three space, you, you can say, I mean, what I now showed is all in three space, but in three space, somehow there are two little um, different options. We have just gradient, rotation and divergence. Okay, three is still more complicated than one, but somehow it still works. So there was not a strong need to really go to this more general treatment. If you then go to four space, four dimensional space time, you have essentially no other choice. So this whole formalism really unfolds its power when you are in higher dimensions. But you're absolutely right. There is actually no reason to really do it in the more complicated way with three different notions for which you have to separately prove theorems. You have to do a Stoke theorem for the rotation and then a Gauss theorem for the divergence and so on. So this is really an overkill. So um, yes, I think it would be, I mean, a very clean program to study physics would be to first learn all these mathematical tools. It would require some endurance to, to go through that and learn all these concepts. And then one could do ele electrodynamics in a much more elegant way, just with these um, uh, with this formalism. Um, yeah, so the answer is what one should do it. The question is just whether the not so mathematically oriented students would survive until the point where finally one could use it and essentially harness um, all the beautiful things that come out of it. Okay, so um, if there are no other questions about that topic or anything before, I would like to now switch to the topic I announced last time, which is the discussion of matter. Now, this does now not immediately correspond to a section in the lecture notes. I will first give you an overview, which is not in the one-to-one -one reflected by the lecture notes. Um, but this will essentially complete the discussion of GR. So after this week, you can say you know everything you need to know about GR as, let's say, a basic theory. Of course, one can now look at arbitrarily complicated tools to find solutions. In, in, um, I mean, even in simple situations, we need actually quite complicated tools to find solutions analytically. But in principle, the basic ingredients of the theory are then there. You know them all. And what is missing at the moment is really the treatment of matter. Actually, we have treated matter already, but in some sense in a different direction. So remember that what the Einstein's what the Einstein equations do, which you will only be able to write down in full um, its full um, glory once we have now defined matter. But what the Einstein equations do is to relate geometry to matter. Now, what we have done so far, I, okay, let me first write the other arrow. So that's what actually the Einstein equations do is the lower arrow. So they tell us how matter influences the geometry. And by that, I mean that this is really what, for example, an earth does. Earth is a matter field or is, is matter. And this matter has an impact on the geometry of space time. Of course, not such a big one as a black hole, but it has an influence. So this is going into this direction. 
what we did so far is actually to go in this direction. We already understand the geometry very well. We have essentially introduced all notions that are needed to describe the geometry, which includes, I mean, geometry mathematically is given by the metric. That's a complete description of the geometry. But then there are certain derived notions like the curvature, R, and there are different curvatures, the Riemann curvature, and we have also defined the Ricci curvature, which is a contraction of the Riemann curvature. But essentially the mathematics that, that describes the geometry is this metric. So we understand that very well. And then we have studied how matter behaves in an interesting geometry, like for example, the Schwarzschild geometry. So when we discuss the Schwarzschild geometry, it's really, we set the metric, we, we, we just assumed this metric is how space time is. We haven't gone from matter to that, we just postulated this geometry for the moment and then studied this direction. We now know, I mean, studying this direction means we, we know how, for example, matter moves within that geometry. And there, matter was really treated in, in the form of test particles. So matter was assumed to be so light that it doesn't itself, again, have a back reaction on the geometry. That's what is meant by calling it test particle. That has a very precise meaning. So a test particle is a particle for which this arrow is irrelevant. That's, by the way, also true for electrodynamics. The test charge is a charge that is so small that, I mean, here would be the charge, and here would be the electromagnetic field. The, the test charge is so small that it does not have an impact on the electromagnetic field configuration. So this direction, if you take this analogy further, corresponds in electrodynamics to essentially um, um, Coulomb force and, force and Lorentz force. They describe how an electromagnetic field, which is the electrodynamic equivalent of the geometry, influences the behavior of charges. And the Maxwell equations would correspond to Einstein's equations. I think I said that already, but this is maybe a good moment to remind you of that fact. On the right hand side, we will have another object. And maybe um, I should mention that already now. Sometimes, or I mean, we would be tempted to think that what is on the right hand side should be technically mass. Because if you look at Newtonian gravity, it's really the mass of the sun or of the earth or of whatever object that generates the gravitational field. So it's very natural to assume that whatever object this T that I wrote down here is somehow describing mass. However, mass is not the right notion here. And the reason is that mass is essentially something that is not conserved. I mean, you, for example, a, a photon is a massless particle, and you know that a, a, a particle with mass can in principle emit photons and therefore become lighter. So the mass changes. I mean, not only in principle, it can do that. So mass changes. And um, nevertheless, a photon, I mean, even though it's massless, will actually still um, will still produce a gravitational field. So we saw already that a photon, in the very first hour, we saw already that a photon is deflected by the gravitational field. But now what I'm saying is that also the opposite is true. A photon, even though it's massless, can create a gravitational field. It can change the geometry of space-time and that will be a consequence of the Einstein equations. So that's not just the fact that I'm telling you and the way this will be reflected by the equations is that this thing is not mass. What this is, is actually energy and momentum. So the bottom line here, and this is really something you should remember, it's not mass that generates or influences the geometry, it's energy and momentum. And accordingly, this object here will be the so-called energy momentum tensor. And incidentally, this will be important. This is something that is conserved locally. So energy cannot change. It cannot, I mean, if, if energy is in a certain volume of space time, it 
the only way it can go to another volume is by flowing there, but it cannot suddenly disappear into nothing or, or, or in a non-local way be transferred. Like energy is here and suddenly it's on another planet. And that will also be a general property of, of what we have to have here. So this has to be something that is conserved as we are going to see. Okay, that was now a kind of introductory part. There is another thing I need to tell you as an introduction, namely that there are conceptually two different ways of treating matter. So, um, okay, conceptual different treatments of matter. So, by the way, I, mean, I, I just told you that a photon will also generate a gravitational field or, or, give, or change the geometry. This means photons and therefore radiation is also matter. So matter is essentially, I could say, all the stuff that is in the universe. It's not only particles, it's everything that is really there in some way. Except for the gravitation itself. I mean, the gravitational wave is not in that sense then stuff of the universe that would be here, that's in the geometry. But everything else is here on the matter side. So think of matter as either particles or an electromagnetic field. But now if you ask yourself, how do we actually treat mathematically these types of matter, then they're also different. This has not necessarily something to do with the fact that one is radiation and the other are particles. It's just essentially a tradition that comes from the way we developed our classical physical theories. And one thing is really that we um, somehow treat matter as particles. And we could also do that with light. I mean, these are then just photons, a photon that flies off. I think we even did that. And this is a bit um, in the same way, or it is really conceptually in the same way as we do it in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, you have point particles. That's a basic object that you study there. But you can also treat matter as a field. And actually, that's also something you know very well, because we do that, at least with radiation, in electrodynamics. And you could do the same, actually, with particles. So instead of saying we have individual point particles, you could say there is a mass distribution somehow. It would be a scalar field. The field would essentially be the density of matter everywhere in space or in space-time. But I, I, I really want to emphasize that these are not two different types of matter physically. They are the very same types of matter. It's just a different mathematical treatment. Now, as we studied this arrow here, how the geometry influences matter, we were mostly working in that picture, I think almost exclusively. So we were just talking about how particles, massive or massless particles behave. So we took this first conceptual treatment of matter. Actually, there will be an exercise this week where we'll somehow connect the two things in the case of waves and proof that if you look at the geometry and how the geometry makes waves propagate or how waves propagate in a non-trivial geometry, that this is consistent with the treatment of photons as particles. That's something one has to prove because it's not a priori clear even what it means that the geometry um, makes the field propagate. The idea there is always that in normal coordinates, it should look as if, um, if it were just in a, in a non-gravitational um, environment. So we would have the ordinary Maxwell equations and therefore um, waves propagate as they would do in, in flat space-time. And in the exercises, you kind of, in that sense, prove that there's a consistency between these two treatments of radiation, once as a wave and once as a particle, if you look at this direction of the arrow. Now we want, as I said, to go in the other direction. So we want to understand um, how matter influences the geometry. And for that, we want to define this energy momentum tensor. This energy momentum tensor can be defined starting from particles 
or starting from a field. I now decided to just start this whole discussion from the viewpoint of particles. This is actually at the end, not the natural view to describe um, the energy momentum tensor, but it connects it to something you already know. So it's essentially a pedagogical, for pedagogical reasons that I first choose particles as a starting point. Later, we will then also connect it to fields. And the hope is that you will, via this treatment, starting from particles, have a very intuitive picture of what this energy momentum tensor is. But at the end, the energy momentum tensor should be more understood as a field. So it's something that is defined everywhere and tells you everywhere in space time how much energy and momentum is there. That's what it is at the end. Okay. So let's start with the technical part after this introduction. So if we start with matter in terms of particles, then of course this matter in terms of particles is usually described in, as a world line. So we have some world line gamma of a particle. Now the idea of what, what we are going to do is to define a field based on the world line. So I will somehow explain to you, as I said, um, the electromagnetic or the, no, the energy momentum tensor is more like a field. So what we are do, going to do technically is essentially to make a transition from the first conceptual um, treatment of matter into the second one. So we will turn the world line treatment into a field. Let me immediately define a field. So let's suppose you have a universe in which there's just one particle which with this world line gamma, but now I want to describe that matter in the universe as a field. So obviously what you would expect is that this field is zero everywhere except on the world line of the particle. Now the first thing that may come a bit as a surprise, maybe no longer, but if you never thought about four-dimensional space-time, um, is that the field will not be a scalar field but a vector field. And I will now just write down a definition. And it's the idea is that you may not understand what this definition, I mean, you should understand it mathematically, but it may not be clear what this definition means physically. And then in the second hour after the break, which I will just make in a minute, um, I, will I will essentially physically motivate this definition. So the claim is the following, that the field that would describe that particle, which I call N, N for number field. It's essentially a field that counts how many particles are there. At the moment, there's only one. So it will be one at the point where the particle is and zero otherwise. This field is defined in the following way. The expression looks a bit complicated and you may ask why it has to look so complicated. And as I said, this will be the topic of just the next lesson after the break. So we take a delta function. That's of course something to be expected. It, it has to be positive wherever the particle is. So I take a delta function that um, compares the coordinates of the world line of the particle with the coordinates of the point Q where I'm looking at the field. So a field should be defined at any point Q. So Q is just an arbitrary point. So that's a point on the manifold of, on the sp in space time. And so the, what this thing tells you is that I take, I mean, first of all, this, this thing is a product. That's not a pi. That's a product over all i's, i from zero to three. So I look at all coordinates, including the time coordinate, and I only get a contribution when the coordinates of the world line agree with the coordinates of the point Q. So only if the point Q lies on this world line, I get a contribution at all. And then for reasons that will become later, I have to normalize this because this is all coordinate dependent, of course. I have the coordinates of a point. I have to normalize this by the, the square root of the determinant. And this is still not a vector. I told you this should be a vector at the end. 
a vector field. So I make it a vector by multiplying this with the velocity vector of the work line at that point gamma tau. And I integrate over all tau. Okay, as I said, don't worry if you don't understand why it looks like that. You should worry if you still don't understand why it looks like that in an hour from now. For the moment, just make sure you understand at least mathematically what it does, how you would evaluate it, what the individual symbols mean that appear in this expression. But let's now make a break so that you can think a bit about that and let's reconvene. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope it's okay if you only make a 10 minutes break, so at two past five. There is a question in chat, Ranato. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. If the field vanishes outside of the world line, it cannot be smoothed on the manifold. Or yes, that's be... absolutely correct. And this is indeed a problem. So the question is, um, if I, and we will discuss that in more detail, but this n that I defined here involves a delta function. And the delta function, as you probably know, is not even a function, but um, strictly speaking, a distribution. But if I regard it as a function, it would somehow be a highly discontinuous function. This is to be expected if I really think of a perfect point particle. So if, if you even think in the conventional spa only space and not space-time picture and ask yourself, what's the field, which is now a scalar field, of a point particle lying somewhere? Then you would expect that it's just zero everywhere um, except at the exact location where this particle is. And there this field has to be very large because all the mass and everything of this particle is concentrated there. So the idea is that um, this is a correct description if you really take it as given that a particle is a point particle. But once we understand that, we will say, let's now, let's then smooth it out. So once we understand, what this n means, we will say actually real mass distributions will be smooth functions. So in, in some way you could say we are for the moment working in a mathematical idealization where particles are really perfect point particles and their things are not smooth. And we will have to deal with that. We will have to treat this n actually as a distribution. We will do that. And then we will go to the more physical setup and say, let's now take into account that actually in physics, the particle is never a perfect point particle. I mean, this, this is an illusion. That's something that one claims in, in classical mechanics. But if you have heard of quantum mechanics, it's obvious that a particle is not a point particle. So let's just consider a smoothed version of this. But this moved, so the difference between the two um, will only be that um, for the physical version, we can again think of the whole thing as a as a function rather than a distribution, which means that we can apply our usual concepts from differential geometry. Okay, so the summary of, of my answer is, um, this is indeed, this has to be treated as a distribution to be mathematically precise. Later, when we move back to non-idealized situations to real physical situations, this will again be a, a smooth field, which we can treat without problem and differentiate and so on. One more question has by him. Can we incorporate the Hersenberg uncertainty here? Okay, that's a, an excellent question. And, and that's something that unfortunately um, doesn't work that easily. So I think the un understanding would be uh, if, if a real part, I mean, we know from quantum mechanics that if I look at here the spatial um, dimension of, I mean, just space. And I look at the um, probability distribution of finding a particle that is described by quantum mechanics in space, then usually this will be um, a distribution that has a certain width here. And this width here, um, let's call it delta x, is somehow constrained by the relation that delta x has to be larger than a fundamental constant, namely the Heisenberg um, constant, divided by, and here is another thing, the uncertainty in the momentum. And there may be a prefactor um, um, here, so maybe a two or so. Um, 
but the point is that um, you see there is here still a dependence on something that could in principle be arbitrarily large and therefore this delta x could still be arbitrarily small so in principle it's possible um, to have particles that ha have, have a almost completely undefined momentum and velocity but in that sense in the quantum mechanical sense but still a very well defined position such a particle would obviously immediately so this could only be so okay that would be a peak that looks like this that could only be true for a very short moment because as i just said the velocity has to be undefined so this particle moves in any direction in some way so immediate if you prepare a particle with this distribution it would spread out immediately so in that sense you cannot keep that but for a short moment quantum mechanics would allow the particle to be essentially perfectly localized now um there is a more general fundamental problem that is the following that in quantum mechanics there could be something even worse for, from the viewpoint of general relativity you could have a particle that is in a superposition here or here and now you could ask yourself what is now the corresponding density of the particle and what people would usually say if these peaks are equally large they would say oh this just means this is a physical situation where the particle is with probability one half somewhere here and with probability one half it's somewhere here but that's now a probabilistic statement. So, so if you now take, and you could say, okay, let's therefore take the expectation value. And you probably already see immediately that this is not a good idea to take the expectation value of the position because the expectation value of the position would be here in the middle. But quantum mechanics tells you it's actually never there. But if you want to somehow talk about the position that it has, um, the expectation value is at least mathematically a natural thing to do, but it's physically completely unnatural because it, you, you're then working with a, um, like a particle that is localized somewhere where R, according to quantum mechanics it never is. Now, why am, am I telling you that? The reason is that indeed there are many treatments of um, half classical treatments of gravity zero where people try to build in quantum mechanics into the description of matter and then apply the Einstein equations where they indeed just take the expectation value of the location of the particle. So that's not a good idea, but it's still done. And the reason why it's done is that we have actually no good alternative. We, we don't know how to treat such a situation where the particle is in a superposition here or here. So apart from the problem that the Heisenberg uncertainty duration doesn't really give us a minimum width of the peak because as i said this delta p could be very large there's also the more fundamental problem that we don't know at all how to incorporate matter described by quantum mechanics into gravity it's done but it's done in a way which physically seems to be quite unmotivated it nevertheless works quite well in practice so people get results from these calculations that seem to somehow be intuitively correct but fundamentally, it cannot be correct. So resorting to quantum theory here is um, would be nice if we could do it, because at the end, gravity has to be combined with quantum theory. But unfortunately, we understand too little at the moment to do it correctly, and um, in particular, cannot be used to solve problems we have with, um, let's say, determining the smallest possible length scale. There is, however, something maybe just as a last addition, unless there are other more urgent questions, that is done. Um, you may ask yourself, what is kind of the smallest length scale of things compatible with um, both quantum mechanics and general relativity at the same time? Now, um, what you could do is to think of a particle that is really extremely localized as before. So I said before, quantum mechanics does not impose a bound on how peak that is. So it could in principle look like this. But then there is again GR that tells you that it would not be a good idea to model a particle like this, because if it's really perfectly peaked, 
then it's, it would be smaller than its own Schwarzschild radius. So in other words, despite the fact that this, the mass of this particle could be small, remember that the Schwarzschild radius R is given by 2m and the gravitational constant. So even if this m is extremely small, it's just one, let's say, elementary particle, there is a positive Schwarzschild radius. So if you manage to localize one single particle so well that it's smaller than its own Schwarzschild radius, then it would collapse into a black hole. So we would have a little black hole there. So this, so in that sense, general relativity again gives us a bound on how localized things can be in some sense. So one could use that again to um, somehow define what is the let's say smallest delta function, or what is the closest approximation of a delta function that still makes physical sense. These are considerations that people are doing. They're quite fun. And, and um, however, they are usually based on certain speculations because for example, we don't know whether a very small particle would ever form a black hole because obviously quantum effects would also become relevant. And um, so in that sense, it's, it's just a speculation to use, um, I mean, it's a speculation in the sense that we apply gravity theory, which has only been tested for large objects into in a regime which where it hasn't been tested at all, namely the regime where masses are very small and where quantum effects play a role. There is one more question asked by the same guy, is that what mm -hmm. hindering him to claim that there is a superposition of energy momentum tensor leading to a superposition of space, space tense? Yes, um, there's no one hindering you to claim that. And this is indeed an approach that some people are taking, but then you have to really move into a full, um, let's say quantum description of gravity. So you see if, if, on, um, if you think of this diagram as the Einstein equation, so we have on the right hand side matter, what you're saying correctly is that if matter was modeled completely quantum mechanically with all its superposition states and so on, then the same has somehow then to be true for the geometry. Otherwise, you cannot match the two things. You cannot treat one in a superposition and the other one not if you really want to apply the equations in, in the way we understand them today. So you would really have to, to go to a, a, a quantum gravity theory in the sense that the whole geometry of space-time is now a quantum property. Now, th there are many problems associated to that, which I may discuss in the last lecture before Christmas connected to the, um, um, to the black hole information paradox. So I, I will not discuss them here, but the, the answer is really, if you try to do that, that is equivalent to the attempt that many, many researchers are doing, which is a very good attempt to try to quantize relativity theory, but it hasn't succeeded so far. And I will, try to give you some hints in the last lecture why it hasn't succeeded, what the difficulties are. I hope that's okay as a kind of preliminary answer to your question. But it's a very natural thing to do, so it's a, you have a very good point. It's just that when you try to do it, you will hit certain obstacles. Um, can I still ask the question? Yes, of course, yes. And um, about the definition you just wrote down at the end of the This one. Uh, First time. Yeah. So, so is this to be understood like component-wise, or or maybe like like how is it even defined integrating the vector um, mm -hmm. along? Because I mean, we can uh -huh. add. Yes. Okay, vector. that's a good question. So here we have an integral over tau, and the tau appears here and here. So actually, it's. Um, Yeah, I think the, yeah, you, you can, okay, maybe the best way or one way to think of it is indeed component-wise. So I realize we haven't, so you, okay, let me back up. So I think the question you're asking is a very good one because you're essentially pointing to the fact that I'm talking here about an object which we haven't defined. We have so far only defined integration over scalars. So the integrals only gave, gave us back um, essentially um, 
scalar num or yes scalars. And now I'm I'm putting here an integral which includes a vector, and that was simply not defined. So in that sense, that's um, ambiguous. So maybe let me okay. I should now, in principle, give you the general definition, but maybe the preliminary answer is yes, you can understand it component wise. But we will actually evaluate this integral, and then I will maybe say a bit more about that. But um, yes, on the, try to see it for the moment as a component wise thing, and then I will come back to your question a bit later. I hope that's okay. But that's a very good question because you're right that that was not formally introduced so far. Thanks. Then I Let me nevertheless now continue and then we will, I mean, we will encounter this because we will have to evaluate this integral and then you will see how this is done. Um, oh, okay, maybe, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, okay, let me say that later, but you see we can always turn a vector into a scalar. So that's, by the way, general trick. You can always say, let's think of a covector applied to the whole thing and then things should still work so one other way to do it for i mean one other preliminary answer i could give you that would immediately actually solve the problem is we could say let's just apply on the left hand side and on the right hand side an arbitrary covector and then this integral and, and assume that um, because of the linearity of the integral which we postulate to be true even for vectors, we can then take this covector into the integral and then everything turns into a, an integral over a number rather than a vector. This is actually equivalent to say that it's component-wise because the covector could just be the covector that extracts a coordinate. But that would be a more general way to say it, which is not coordinate dependent. And of course, as you probably know by now, I prefer to say things in a coordinate independent way. So that would be the coordinate independent answer. Okay, now the first thing we have to verify is in, I mean, there are other reasons. I just said I want to do things coordinate independently. This is of course highly non-coordinate dependent because you see here the coordinates appear. And whenever I define something in terms of coordinates, I have necessarily to prove that it's at the end not coordinate dependent. Otherwise, the object wouldn't make sense as a vector field because on the left hand side, there's no coordinate. So, writing this as a vector or claiming that this is a vector field is a claim I have to prove. It's not given by just writing here anything. And indeed, you will see that if I, for example, didn't write this G here, this would not be well defined in the sense that the object I will get would depend on the choice of coordinates. So now during the break, there was a question, namely, isn't it a problem that this is actually, I mean, these deltas are of course distributions and not functions. And I really want to treat them correctly. So let's first think about what it means that N, this vector field is actually rather a distribution rather than a function. So you have probably learned in, um, in, in your first two years that a distribution is an object that takes as an input the test function. This is now not so important. If you're not familiar with test functions, you can just ignore what I'm saying now for the more, I mean, you just ignore it and whatever I will do after will still be clear. It will not rely on that. This is more to make clear to those who are more mathematically minded that this is all well-defined. So I define now what it means that we have a field on a manifold and that is actually a distribution. So it's not a field as we, as we treated it so far. A field was usually a function that applies to every point in the manifold a value. It should now be understood as a distribution. So this means that this field is itself applied to a test function. The test function is now in differential geometry a function that is defined everywhere on the manifold. And now you know from the theory of distributions that what we do is just to integrate over, usually over space or over R, if you are in, in R in analysis, but here we are integrate over the manifold. And we of course know what integration of the, over the manifold means of this distribution um, with phi, if we are, 
I mean, this integral is now, of course, a formal integral, but that's what was defined in distribution theory. So we just take this integration. But you know that this is not a well-defined integral. So remember that I, I emphasized last week all the time or several times that an integration over a scalar is not something well-defined. We always need to integrate the form. And the generic way to make a form is to just integrate over the volume form. So this is now, a, essentially you can take this as a definition. That's what it means to evaluate the distribution on a test function. But this object is a well-defined object. So that's by itself a coordinate independent way of defining what it means to evaluate a distribution or a test function. So that could be true for any, this is now not specific to n, that could be anything, any distribution. So maybe I'll, okay. Um, yeah, maybe for clarity, I should really write here some arbitrary distribution and then there is here some arbitrary distribution. Just to make clear, this has nothing to do with the n, this definition. But now, of course, we apply to n. So phi is just an arbitrary function on the manifold. I should say that. So that's a function on m, on space time. Okay, now we apply this definition and want to verify that what comes out of it is coordinate independent. As I said, we have to do that task. And this will at the same time of course, tell us how to integrate. So it will also answer the previous question in some way. So we do that. So I just copied the definition of what it means to apply this. Now we have to remember what it means to integrate over a manifold. And for simplicity, I will just assume that the whole manifold is covered by the same chart. Of course, you know that in, in general, I would have to um, choose um, a distribution of unity and, and, and make sure I can compose all the charts. But I guess you believe me that this can be done. Done. That's just linear at the end. I mean, I just integrate over the individual um, charts and then sum them up. And so let's here assume that the manifold is covered by one chart. Now, integration over the manifold is defined in terms of normal integration over R four in this case, because we have a four dimensional manifold. So I have four integration variables. And these four integration variables now have to be just multiplied with the function. Can, I talk, can you scroll up on the right a bit? Yes, I already did. I just saw it by, by accident. Um, now we have to evaluate the function n on um, wherever whatever point these coordinates indicate. So what's the point in the manifold indicated by the coordinate? I have to apply the inverse chart map because the size are the, the coordinates in the chart and n is a function defined on the manifold. So I have to indicate the chart map. I will now not draw a diagram, but you know in the meantime how these diagrams look like. I have to do the same with phi. I also have to do that. And when I write here psi, I really mean the the four, oh, okay, this was now stupid. Of course, the largest xi is xi three, but there are four different size. And when I just write xi here, I mean, of course, xi zero, xi one, xi two, xi three, so all the coordinates. And then we said in the definition of an integral that there is this additional factor, square root of the determinant of g, that was needed in order to make the notion of an integral independent of coordinates. So let's now insert everything. So I still have this integration. Now I insert the expression for n. Of course, I can make my life easy because you see in the expression for n, I have the square root of g in the denominator. And here we have again a square root of g. So these g's cancel. I don't have to write any g's. I still have, as you can see here, the summation, eh, not the summation, the product over all i's from zero to three of the delta functions of xi i, eh, of gamma i of the i's component at tau. Oh, and now I forgot, okay, I forgot something. Excuse me. I should also integrate, of course, over tau because the n here that I'm now inserting has an integration over tau. 
So I'll have to put this integral over tau here. And then I put the rest of, of this. So what is the next term here? According to the definition, I have xi of um, the point Q. But what is the point Q? The point Q is now here x to the minus one of xi. But of course, if I apply x to the minus one of xi, and then again, x of whatever comes out, then this x cancels. So I, get, I just get the xi i's, the component xi i. And then I still have the velocity vector v. And now think here really of the components. And um, yes. So now maybe I should really be correct and to answer, I mean, to make sure this question, the question of the task is understood. Let me, we have to, because we are here anyway in a component dependent um, description, we will have to have the same component on the left and on the right. So let me indicate here with an orange color to make it clear um, that we have this here. And this K should now, appear everywhere. So we have now the case component of, of the velocity. And then um, I think we are almost done. Something is still missing. Oh, I still need to multiply with phi of, um, yeah x minus one of this psi. Okay. Now it's, we can simplify things because what, what the, I mean, we are now in physics and in physics, um, we are, I will not go into the details of why we can commute certain things, but you know from the, from the discussion of distributions in analysis that it is possible to exchange here integrals under appropriate conditions, which I will not now not discuss, but I'll just tell you that they are given. So I can essentially take this integration inside here, the integration over tau. So I, I put the integration over tau first, and now I have this integration over all the xi. But this integration over xi now hits this delta functions. And there is one delta function for each i from 0 to 3. So each of these xi's just gets turned into gamma i. So I can ignore this whole thing and this whole integration and just replace all the xi i's by gamma i. But the xi appears here. So this is the point um, in the, on the manifold that is, um, I mean, this is now gamma i. And of course, x to the minus one of gamma i is just the point gamma of the curve. So in other words, I can here just write, okay, let me first write the expression for um, the velocity that just remains with the index here. And then I have here phi of gamma tau. So I replace the size by gamma. Now, because this is true for any k, or, and because um, you have no other coordinates appearing, if you, if you look at this expression here, there's no x appearing any longer. So the choice of the coordinate is no longer relevant. So this is in that sense, an expression that is coordinate independent. Once I, I realize that it's true for all k. So again, here to argue that it's for all k, I, I mean, another way to do that, as I mentioned before, would be to apply here at the outside, just an arbitrary covector. So this K here is not contributing to the coordinate dependence. So just think of here, define a covector omega, apply omega here and apply omega here and we get the same expression and then I pull omega out. So the whole thing is coordinate independent, which was a necessary thing to do in order to convince you that the expression I defined here even makes sense. Nonetheless, this, 
doesn't yet give you any intuition for why this is a good expression. So far, we're still purely on the mathematical side. I just convince you that it's at least mathematically a sensible expression in, in the sense that it's actually really a vector field. It's not some coordinate dependent thing. It's a well-defined vector field on the manifold. Now we come to a more, let's say, physical consideration. Now we want to understand what this vector field does. For that, it's useful to return to our yotta thing. So we will introduce this reform. And this reform is given by applying this yotta function to n with respect to the metric omega g. That's exactly what we did at the very beginning of today's lecture when I told you that we can represent the um, rotation of, of a vector field, this vector that I called set as a two form, but there we were in three space and now we are in four space, in four dimensional space time. So when we represent a vector field, we can represent the vector field again as a form, but the natural form, I mean, the form we will get is now a three form. And this three form will have a meaning that we, are, we will understand physically. So that's why I'm doing that. So in, in some sense, you could say the N is just, um, okay, let me briefly scroll up here. The N is a bit, like an object here. And actually it turns out that objects on the right hand side are somehow more natural to, to understand. So let's just move to the right hand side by applying this yotta operation, which will correspond to that arrow. And instead of thinking of vectors, really think of three forms. Now for the moment, you're probably less familiar with three forms than with vectors. Nonetheless, you will see that this makes a lot of sense. So a three form um, has, of course, okay. Let me give it a name because I will have to write it so often that um, this will be cumbersome. So let me call this thing in with a little bar on top of it. That's now a three form again. So n bar is just another re representation of n. Instead of as a vector, I represent it as a three form, but now it has components and the components of the three form are now, for example, the component one, two, three. That's one component. Another component would be n zero, two, three, for example. How is this component defined? It's defined by actually inserting the definition of what n bar is and then evaluating it at the basis vectors, or with the basis vectors. That's exactly how um, I told you now many times that this is how we very easily get the components. We just feed the tensor with the basis vectors and get as an answer the components. Okay, now we also have a definition of what um, this I means. So this I means that we just insert essentially the form, okay, maybe I do now two steps in one because that you're now familiar with that. This form here, as you know, is defined by, um, in, can be written as a base in terms of a basis. And we did that already for three space, but for four space, it looks the same. So it's square root of the determinant of G times dx0, dx1, dx2, dx3. It's the same expression as I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, where it didn't start from zero, but from one. But apart from that, it's really the same. So it's a, it's a volume form in space time. And if I do that, remember the other thing that this yotta just means that we take the form. So the form, I'll copy it again, the form is that one, dx0, dx1, dx2, dx3, all with exterior products. And we evaluate this whole form by inserting as the first argument, the thing that stands here, the vector field N. So I'll put here the vector field N. And then the other arguments are just the ones that are mentioned already, B, um, B to the dxi for i going from one to three. 
Now just really insert the N explicitly. So the N is an integration. I take the integration out of the whole thing. So these are all linear functions. So that's easy to do. And remember now, um, again, that the N, okay, I mean, you don't have to remember. You can just look it up here. The N is defined with this G. And this G will again cancel with the G here this time. So if I now insert N into the whole thing, I can again get rid of all the Gs. So it was really useful to have this G somehow in the definition of N. But you saw it without it, it would anyway not be a basis independent thing. And now I just copy the definition, the remaining part of the definition of N, which is this product of delta functions. And um, at the end, multiply with the vector um, gamma tau. Now, actually, I, I do something else here. And that's why I said um, I'll, I'm going to do everything in one step, more or less. So if you look at this expression here that is under the green bracket, what does it do? So notice that these vectors here are, or this exterior product means that you have these basis vectors in all possible permutations. However, because the last three arguments, like in our consideration for the B field at the beginning, the last three arguments are already fixed to be d to the dx1, d to the dx2, d to the dx3. The only possibility is that you have the ordering of these basis vectors where you have the last three being one, two, and three. So the only remaining one here is dx0. So, okay, just to make clear what I mean here. So it's really equivalent to what we did here. So where we had, in principle, I would have to write all permutations. Like here, we had this expression with the exterior product. We write the sum over all permutations, but then we found out that only one permutation matters. This is exactly the same here. Only the, the identity permutation matters. So the dx0 is the only element that will act on n, which means that what this whole thing does, it just attracts extracts the n the zeros component of the vector n from the whole thing. So I could therefore, um, I therefore have to write here also an n a zero here. So it's not the whole vector. It's, it, this whole thing extracts a component of the vector n. And that's, the, the, I mean, we saw here in this definition, the k that appears here corresponds to the k here. So. I can just put the zero here. Okay. Now we have another expression. So we have now um, a form. And you see the nice thing about this expression compared to the previous one is that it actually doesn't involve the metric any longer. And that's somehow more natural. That's why, um, I mean, it's an equivalent representation. It's, or actually it's, an, it's another representation of the same information. So if you give me the n in this form, I can again transform it back. Now I showed you how to get from n to n bar, but of course I could also go into the other direction. Now it's this object that I would like to really give a physical meaning. So in some way you should understand the definition we made at the beginning as kind of a preliminary thing, which is a vector which gave rise then to a three form and this three form is actually the physically relevant thing. So I could equally well have started with this, but the point, and, and then I could have transformed it into a vector by um, doing this yotta backwards. That would also have been another approach. So that's of course um, equivalent. I can always define anything I want if I know at the end that two things are equivalent. So let's now try to understand what the form is. So the form has the nice property that we can integrate over it. So to understand what it is, let's integrate over it. But let's, let's integrate over, oh, maybe first notice, because it's a three form, we have to integrate over a spatial surface or not a, sorry, not a spatial surface. We have to integrate over a three dimensional sub manifold. But a spatial surface is of course, a particular instance of a three-dimensional sub-manifold of space-time. So we can really think of integrating over space. 
So in space-time, that's something you should remember or, or be aware of. In space-time, when you integrate only over space, that's really integrating over a sub-manifold, over a three-dimensional sub-manifold. And let's now do that. So let's integrate over an arbitrary surface, over a space-like. So it's for the moment not arbitrary, but let's assume space-like surface that I call sigma. Actually, it doesn't matter whether it's space-like or not, um, except that it would maybe call the court, take different names for the coordinates. But I choose this um, just to make things a bit more concrete. So take a coordinate system such that the, if I represent the surface in terms of coordinates, I want that this surface now is a subset just of the plane. So that's very, very natural representation, or that's a very natural choice of coordinate system. So if you have a, a three-dimensional sub manifold in a four-dimensional space, then just choose it, choose a coordinate system in such a way that one coordinate is just always zero. Of course, you can always do that. You just define the coordinate system in that way. And there are no constraints on how you define coordinate systems, as long as they give a one-to-one -one relation between the coordinates and um, the manifold. So xi there are now only three remaining components, um, Xi1, Xi2, and Xi3. In addition, we will, just for technical reasons, assume that this coordinate system is also cho chosen in such a way that dx0 applied to the velocity vector of the um, of any moving particle is positive. So this essentially gives an orientation to the surface. So you know any surface has an orientation and the orientation um, essentially is given by the, how, the, how the coordinate representation looks like. And um, I, could, I now give therefore an, an orientation by saying in which direction the x0 vector so to speak, or what, is X, what the zero component means. What does it mean to have a positive zero component? So notice that the zero component is somehow orthogonal to the surface, but this is a bit similar, or it's actually really equivalent to what we do usually in three space. In three space, when I give an orientation to the surface, I think of a normal vector. So for example, if I take my table, I would say the normal vector is the one pointing upwards, but I could also say, no, the normal vector is the one pointing downwards. This will be the same table surface, but with an op opposite orientation. And here we do the same. We take the component, which is orthogonal, which is the big zero component, and say that something has to be positive in this direction. So we somehow define the thing that is upwards in time to be the positive thing. So this, it's like the surface of the table looks into the direction where time is positive in some way. That's not too important, this orientation. I mean, we have to do, mathematically it's important, but um, now for our intuition, that's just a side remark. Okay, let's evaluate this integral. So we evaluate the integral over sigma i n. Oh, sorry. We wanted to integrate over um, what I called n bar. Now we have, of course, an expression of n bar. So let me put it here. n bar is now a, a three form. So it, this is all well defined. We are well allowed to do this integration. And we are now again using just the definition of an integration. So what does integration mean? We have to go to a coordinate system. And of course, we go to the coordinate system that we just chose, the one in which xi one is xi zero is zero, so to speak and integrate the form. So the form means that we now, according to our definition of integration, have to take just the component one, two, three. So remember, this is really how we defined integration. We said, let's go to a coordinate system and then integrate in this coordinate system 
using the components. Now, um, I, I insert the explicit expression for this thing. We just calculated it, so we know what that is. Um, you have the, so it's still the same integral over all these different size in all three spatial directions that I have. And then the n bar itself still has an integration over tau. That's this thing here. So let's just copy that as well. And then the delta function. So it's again actually the product over i now. Okay, the i still goes from zero to three. You have to remember that despite the fact that the size only goes from one to three, because in the definition of n, there's really this product from zero to three. And then we have here um, whatever this delta function tells us, and with that we have to do this. Um, Thing now that of course this x i is now the xi the integrate over the size. That's the outer integral. Great essentially over all points q, and so that's why the xi go there where I would have the coordinate of the point q. And then we still have to multiply with the vector v or with the zeros component of the vector. Now this is again very easy because I can again take the integration over the size inside the tau integration for the same reasons as before. And then three of these delta functions go away, not the one with i equals zero, that one remains. So what I get is the integration over the tau. And then let me just already put here the velocity vector, the zeros. Okay, I think we had the zeros component of that one. I've got the zero before, so let me put it again back, gamma tau. And then we have still one delta function left, namely the one corresponding to i equals zero. But for i equals zero, xi is, xi zero is zero. So we just have a delta function of gamma zero of tau. Um, Yes, I think that's it. That's our integral. Now we can further simplify it. Namely, what we can do is to realize that the velocity, the zeros component of the velocity can be written as just d gamma over d tau, uh, d gamma zero over d tau. Remember, that was something we derived when we discussed world lines and so on. This is just a zero velocity vector. Then I still have the delta function. And let's now do, okay. Um, please allow me to here scratch the integration variable again. I wrote here a d tau, but I didn't want to write the d tau because I want to do something else. I want to do a replacement, a substitution of variables. So instead of integrating over tau, let's just integrate, let's take as a new integration variable, essentially this thing here. Um, um, that thing. So let's just call this gamma zero and take that as an integration variable. Of course, I can always change variables and notice that gamma zero, this is the position in the coordinates of the of the world line, or it's the zero component of the of the world line. This is uniquely, this is in one-to-one -one relation to tau, because the world line is always going upwards in one direction. So I'm allowed to change the integration variable to d gamma and zero. So that's now my new integration variable. But if I change integration variables, then as you know from the theory of integration, I need an additional factor here, which is in this case, d tau to d gamma zero. This is just to compensate for the fact that I changed the integration variables. But this is of course nice because you see this thing is just the inverse of that, essentially. I mean, it is that. So what I get is just an integration of d gamma zero of delta gamma zero, and this is just equal to one. Okay, now what does this tell us? Actually, I made an assumption here, which I forgot to write, which would have been important to tell you. Let's suppose 
Okay, let's put this here as an additional red remark. Assume that the world line gamma crosses sigma. That was an assumption. Why was this an assumption? So if I integrate, I mean, I, I was not careful enough to always write exactly the range of integration. Of course, the range of integration, if I wrote it down, would be the image of sigma. So I would always have to write the image of sigma in the chart. Now, of course, the delta function here at the very end only gives one if gamma zero, I mean, or if gamma zero includes zero. So gamma zero is the coordinate of, or, okay, sorry, that was already earlier relevant. So here, already in, in the steps here where we collapsed all these delta functions, we said this all gives one. That's why we got rid of them. So this integration over the delta function just said, we ident it's one if gamma i is equal to psi i. But of course, this only gives one if the integration range is such that the psi at some point becomes equal to gamma. And this is only the case if the surface over which I integrate cuts gamma at some point. If we didn't, if this wasn't the case, we would have gotten zero. So note that if gamma does not intersect sigma, we get that this whole expression, the integration over n over sigma gives zero. So that's, as I said, the explanation of that is simply that here, when we went from this integral here, from these delta functions to here, we would just not pick up anything from the delta functions. These would, we would integrate over a range where they are always zero. And then of course the whole expression becomes zero. So we now found something which is interesting. We found that n is a form and its integration has a very clear meaning, almost trivial meaning. It's just that when we integrate over a surface, the result is one if the world line passes the surface and zero otherwise. That's almost the simplest thing we could have gotten. And so it, it maybe turns, it looks like an overkill to define all that to just at the end have some expression, some field, a three form. So that's something that is defined everywhere, which has the property that it can essentially detect whether a particle passes a certain surface. Despite this very trivial kind of meaning of this expression, so that's now really the, the meaning of this N. And it will be an incredibly useful concept to understand. But um, maybe to see a bit more why this is relevant, let me do one more thing just for the end of this lecture. Let's suppose, so for the moment, suppose we have K or a certain number of particles, let's say, um, yeah, I wanted to write big N, it's a bad idea, and big N as well. So let's suppose we have capital K particles with charges Q1 and so on until QK. So charged particles. And now we could define a charge. I call it a charge field. This is not the official expression. We will, I will give you the official expression on Thursday, it's a bit more complicated thing. Um, or, I mean, the expression is not more complicated, but the expression will only make sense later. Um, but let's for the moment call it a charge field by just saying let's sum over all these little charges. So we have um, some summation index, and now put a completely different one that we didn't use before. Let's say u goes from one to k. So I choose a different index because that has nothing to do 
with the um, spatial directions or anything like that. It's a, it's a summation over all the particles. And then I put the charge Q of the use particles times an N. And now remember the N field was defined, if you look at here, depending on, on gamma. I mean, I didn't write the gamma here on the left hand side because we only had one word like gamma. But let's take it as, um, as understood that if I put here a little gamma, then I mean um, the n that is defined via that world line. And so let's take the world line of the use particle. So maybe I should have written here end world lines gamma u. So there are all these charges and each charge is a little particle that has a world line. And these world lines are gamma one to gamma k. And now I sum up. So each charge itself defines such a field. And now I weight the field with the corresponding charges and get a total charge. And now I can again look at the three form, which is defined by just applying this yotta function. So it would be a q bar. It's just defined by yotta applied to q and with respect to, to the volume form. Then we have the following that if I integrate over some sigma, if I integrate this form, what I get is now in words, the total charge in sigma. That's now obvious because remember that the integration will give a one for any of these particles if it passes through the surface sigma and the zero otherwise. So I will just sum up the charges that pass through sigma. So now I have, I have been able to define a much more interesting field. I could now take all charges in the universe that are there and I would have a field Q, it's a vector field that somehow specifies the whole charge distribution everywhere. And how does it specify it? What, what's really the meaning? What I can do is I take this field as a three form, integrate it over any desired region that interests me, some sigma, and I get the total charge there. So in that sense, this is really something that you could understand as the charge density in some way. It gives you the same information as if you had a charge density. Notice, however, that it's a vector. And the reason why this is a vector will be something I will explain to you in two days from now. So on Thursday, we will study that and it should become clear why it has to be a vector and why it makes a lot of sense for this to be a vector. But maybe it's already clear to you now from mathemat at least from a mathematical perspective that because it's a vector, this corresponding form here is the three form. And of course, if I want to ask a question like how much charge is in a certain spatial region, I need a three form. Okay, that was all for today. See you again on Thursday.